Welcome to the first ever live stream of What If Women in Film Festival. This is a multilingual presentation, so please select the appropriate language just here below and enjoy the show. Thanks for joining us. I'm Susanna Metzger. And I'm Charlotte Gantenbein. This festival is all about documentaries made by women about women. Today we honor the 50 years jubilee of gender equality in Switzerland and we celebrate International Women's Day with a selection of stories which will be featured and presented by the filmmakers themselves. What If Women in Film Festival will host its second edition in November, later this year, so we will tell you more about it in a few minutes. Just stay with us. So let's kickstart with a two-minute film that has a very endearing title. It's called What If? starring Carla Azar on drums voice over by Helen Mirren, DOP by Ava Burkowski, directed, edited and produced by Caroline Sasha Gorges. We will have a short interview with her after the film to understand the soul behind it. Enjoy! What if women were paid the same as men? for the same jobs. That would benefit children, since women spend nine out of 10 earned dollars on their families, while men spend only up to four out of 10 earned dollars on their families. What if no laws restricted the types of jobs women could do? Then labor productivity would increase, in some countries by up to 25%. What if women farmers had access to fertilizers, education, land and bank loans to the same extent as men? Up to 150 million fewer people would go to bed hungry every day. What if women and men had the same access to education? The global economy would grow, child mortality would fall, and more children would benefit from adequate nutrition and immunization. What if women and men were better at sharing the unpaid work at home? Then women could participate more in the labor force. If we close the gaps in employment participation and wages between women and men, Women could globally increase their income by an amount equalizing the GDP of the US. What if we realize the potential of equality? This film was part of a competition promoted by the Y, a Danish organization. And in 2016, they, the theme was Why Women. This is an organization that promotes thought-provoking documentaries about human rights. Hi, Caroline. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me on this wonderful event. How did you come up? with choosing drums as support of the text and who is the drummer? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, as uh, you mentioned before, this was um, a competition where this um, little film uh, won and, uh, you know, has the symbol of someone going to the sort of the war drum, going to work, going to war. But what I think is so amazing with this sort of style that um, Carla Sa is drumming is that she's taking this sort of hyper-masculine uh, sort of rock and roll drum image, but she's making it so effortless. And uh, you as a filmmaker, a, a woman filmmaker, what has been your experience so far? Uh, I've, had, uh, I've had many experiences. I actually just want to mention one thing also regarding to the film, because the credits, the fact, the fact that it was a competition, the credits aren't 
uh, in the film. So I also want to make a shout out to the cinematographer who did the shooting because that's a female cinematographer, uh, Ava Berginowski, and she lives in LA and uh, Carla Sa also lives in LA and uh, uh, she just came out of film school when we did this and now she's an award-winning working cinematographer. So my experience as a filmmaker is also uh, in terms of gender and gender equality has also uh, been educating myself in uh, choosing female partners to work with within the film industry. I, I, I was educated at Centropa with being the assistant of Lars von Trier and, uh, back in the days. And that was sort of this place where I came in as a very young girl with this patriarch and these very fierce women, almost brutal women uh, around him. Well, but then also sort of on a woman to woman relation, how are you, how do you collaborate? How do you not, how do you embrace being sensitive and being, uh, being allowed to, um, to not be this uh, war and I really celebrate that because I found that being the biggest boundaries in in advancing and in and, and moving breaking those glass ceiling is that it's there's been this stereotype of that the artist is a male and the producer is a female and there's this sort of mother child relation almost between them we all have a responsibility as storytellers and or as people in this world to to look at where we can change things at the level we are at and uh, i think it's so um i mean i'm keeping baffled about how i reproduce and we all reproduce the cultural uh sort of conditions that we have been uh, we have grown up with so and also being more gentle towards um each other as uh uh, women to women. I, I keep having that as a sort of um, a mantra because the, my main conflicts have often been with women in the in work work relationship. Your final message for International Women's Day, Caroline. Yeah, my 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 method is to be a, stay aware and look what can you do if, even if it's on a small scale and uh, supporting each other. Caroline, thank you so much for your time. It was lovely meeting you today. It was wonderful spending time with you. Thank you for having me. Wir wollen inspiriert werden. We walk on Mit Chris. Guten Abend, Claire. Ihretwegen möchte ich ein besserer Mensch sein. Überwältigt. In Geschichten finden wir uns wieder. Brühnet, wenn es aufhört. Und lachen, wenn es weitergeht. Wenn Sieg erleben und Niederlagen. Grösser werden. Wir leben Geschichten. Und geben ihnen ein neues Zuhause. Mit dem packendsten Live-Sport-Angebot. Coole Games, die interessantesten News, unzählige Filme und Serien und der neueste Kinoblockbuster. All das ist Blue. Bereit für grosse Emotionen. Hope you are enjoying so far. We have an important announcement to make. What If Women in Film Festival is starting a long-term partnership with Blue Cinema. This means that in November the festival will take place at the Corso in Zurich. We interview the CEO of Blue Cinema, Philip Teschler, on the future of theatres, women in film and our newborn collaboration. Let's hear this conversation. Hello, Philip. Hello. The actual Zeit ruf nach Veränderungen. Wie erlebt die digitale Revolution, wie empfindest du das? Ja, es ist eine sehr spezielle Zeit. Ich finde, die digitale Revolution die kommt natürlich automatisch, durch das wir ja Kinos zu haben. Das ist logisch. Ich freue mich natürlich wieder, wenn die Normalität wieder kommt. Also, die Normalität wird so nicht mehr kommen. Wir werden uns alle umstellen müssen. Das wird Konsolidierungen geben auf dem Markt. Aber schlussendlich, glaube ich, ist das Kino schon immer da gesagt worden. Und es wird immer alles überleben. Und ähm, dann, wie siehst du Frauen, welche ihre Geschichten auf die Linie bringen? Primär muss ich mal sagen, finde ich es einfach gut, wenn irgendjemand eine gute Geschichte bringt. Ob das mal eine Frau ist, 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 ist mal sekundär. 
Ähm, auf der anderen Seite erlebe ich Frauen natürlich ganz anders, wie sie Geschichten erzählen. Also jetzt aus meiner Sicht aus ich sehe, finde ich's, ähm, ich finde es viel attraktiver, weil es meistens mehr Tiefgang hat. Es ist weniger an der Oberfläche, es hat mehr Tiefgang. Das gefällt mir bei Frauen. Filme sind einfach näher. Frauen gehen durch das auch höhere Wagnis ein ähm, bei der Geschichte und Erzählung und sie bringen es klarer aufs Tabet. Woraus kann sich das Publikum in den Jahr 2021 in der Blue Cinema Kinos freuen? Ja, der Blue Cinema kann man sich alles freuen. Ich hoffe nicht, dass man es dann wieder voll könnte, äh, zeigen kann. Also ohne irgendwelche Auflagen, dass man natürlich wieder kann nebeneinander sitzen kann, dass man das Gemeinschaftserlebnis wieder hat. Ich glaube, das ist das Wichtigste, dass man aus den vier Wänden rauskommt und miteinander wieder kann brüllen und lachen Ich glaube, das, das vermissen wir alle und versuchen, ein attraktives Kino zu machen. Rund um die Gestaltung auch sechs vom Billet kaufen, auf der 360 Grad Journey zu machen, hoffentlich dann auch mit guten Inhalten. Was bedeutet es, What If Women in Film Festival in den Corso zu bringen? Ähm, ich habe gewartet, bis so etwas kommt. Ein, äh, ein Filmfestival von Frauen, für Frauen, also für alle Kinogänger natürlich, aber speziell in diesem Segment ausgesucht. Und, äh, also, wo das an mich angetragen wurde, habe ich gesagt, klar, das unterstützen wir, das machen wir, das ist cool. Ähm, es ist jetzt im November, Ende November, da riskieren wir natürlich noch, dass wir den Bond würden spielen würden oder weiss ich was. Und ich sagte, gut, das ist ja gleich. Ähm, so Sachen sollte man unterstützen. Und man sollte es breit in die Welt tragen, weil Festivals haben eine grosse Anziehungskraft in der Presse. Und für mich ist alles gut, wenn man über das Kino erzählt. So save the date, 19th to 21st of November, Corso Zurich. It will be unforgettable. Stay tuned to our channels as we will give regular updates. Ticket information will be available later in the year. Today, the What If Women in Film Festival is honoring the voices of women from around the world with you. Next up, Playing the Game, directed by Clara Kakowski and Julie Hinkier which is another film from the Y organization. Let's watch it and straight after speak with Mette Hoffman Mayer about the work that they are doing in this world on human rights. Dear dad, when you were a boy, your father played football with you. He took you out in the garden to practice from when you were only four years old. Your father taught you how to tackle, how to get up again after falling, and how to learn from your mistakes. He taught you the game, the rules, and how to bring yourself into play. Later, you started playing in a club. You had formal training and a great coach who made you aware of your strengths and weaknesses. You learned how to find out if you're a striker or a defender. You learned strategy and tactics. You got to know the field, the game, and how to play the different positions. You became one of the guys, and together you made big decisions in the changing room. When you got older, you and your friends continued to play the game. Now it was taking place in the executive world. All bigger decisions were still made in your changing room and tripwires were preventing women from entering. Dear Dad, only 8% of executives in the world are women. Only one out of five parliament seats belong to women and 95% of all countries have a male head of state. Dear Dad, What will I have to do to bring myself into play? How will I get to know the field, the game, and how to play the different positions? And will I ever get into the changing room? 
where the decisions are made. Dear Dad, will you help me? Hi, Mette, so nice to meet you. So nice to meet you and thank you for, for inviting me to this conversation. Well, thank you for being here. Um, what is it to be the head of an organization like the Y and how did you get there? Well, I, I basically founded, I'm the co-founder of the Y. Uh, so um, it started out in a little different what actually the organization is now. I have been heading a documentary department at Danish TV for many years, worked with documentaries. So in the beginning, the Y was kind of an kind of an umbrella organization for public service TV stations where we tried to set bigger agendas and we hope to create dialogue and awareness and knowledge and to spark uh, better understanding. I think what many people need to understand and and why we think what we are doing uh, is the only organization in the world and why it's important is that more or less four billion people so half of the world's population only speak their own local language 3.6 billion which is also nearly half of the world's population have no internet access nearly one billion cannot read and write so 80% of the world's population don't even speak English. So what we are trying to do is to really uh, localize our global content and to make Swahili language version, Farsi, Arab, you know, whatever, Skosa, <laughs> uh, Hindi, uh, all these languages so, so that we can serve people in their, uh, you know, own language and spark debates and dialogues and documentaries can do a lot particularly if they're fact-based and not trying to you know have its own agendas but you tell a story about a life or about some political things but just as it is so today is international women's day what is your message the message is that we should really go on fighting for equal rights it's just extraordinary i mean it's unbelievable and it's heartbreaking to see how women are still treated in in the world um, and how women are secondary to to men many many places and what the why is doing is that we put a light on these uh, obstacles and what hinders girls and women opportunities to create equal lives for filmmakers making films i think it's it's no matter what the topic is, it can have nothing to do with equal rights or human rights, but actually to notice things, you know, to notice, to pay attention to small things uh, that will be everywhere where you can see the, the differences or the inequalities or so just pay attention to what you think is a weakness in, in, in the systems. Bienvenue chez Prête à Parler. Why should you learn French online with us? Our success rate is 
Well, the worst situation, you can die. First, I'm always driving, say, maybe I'm not going, maybe I just go and check. I always have a fright, for sure. Every time I go to Nazareth, I'm afraid. Why? Because I like to feel the fear. I like to understand more about myself and in the big waves, it's like you push your limits. You, you get out of your comfort zone. Fear is the same emotion of adrenaline. And, and what's adrenaline give you? Give you like energy, give you, put you aware, put you like focus, um, and fear exactly the same. And if you can use this tool for the good, and don't mix with panic, because panic is another feeling. It's the brother of fear, but it's the one he's going, he going to kill you. And the fear, he's going to put you alive, because put you aware. And in a in dangerous situation, you need to find a plan. And with the fear, you can find this, but with panic, you block the mind. The exercise I do a lot is breathing techniques and meditation. It, it helped me a lot for the big waves, take like every day 10 minutes, 20 minutes of my life to just focus on myself and to just understand me and meditating and breathing. So many changes in people when they start to breathe in a conscious way. For Joanna, it can be a difference between life or death. She can prevent moments of panic, of anxiety, and even if she falls, she has the ability to bring that stillness to her. So that is the big advantage of knowing how to breathe. Forgetting, hmm. she's a, a beast. I think the mental, mental game and the mental part, it's much more important than the spiritual part of the physical parts. Because of the reality, we come from, we come to this world with a lot of fears. We come with a lot of box inside of us. Now I say just fuck, 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 fuck this. <laughs> I try to just breathe and try to connect with myself and try to feed good energy and good positive and do the things with my heart. Because if I'm not going to do my things with my heart, I think it can happen something. I think now like what the world asks us is to live in a presence and is what the fear gives us. Is this, this tool is like to be aware of everything. It's a time to focus more for ourselves. Everyone in the world is in the same boat, so we cannot predict the future. So we need to be aware to be present. It doesn't matter if you pray, if you breathe, if you meditate. It's just take time for yourself. Try to understand yourself. I think in a big ways I learned a lot dealing with my life. Yeah, uh, before I was a person very stressed, very anxious. Um, don't understand too much about the fear. And now I start to understand like fear can be a good tool for your life. Always two voices inside of me say one, say you don't go, and another say go, you can do it.
Wow, it passed so fast. So, you know, when you, when you really like one thing, you forget the time, you forget to eat, you forget everything, you are in a presence. I don't use watch. I like to give message to people. No. I'm, I'm not a guru. I, I deal with fear, but now the fear it's my friend, and I have and I I want to understand more and more and more about the emotions, the fears we have inside of us. I'm afraid to die. I'm afraid to to be in this life. How do you say? Death, mm -hmm. not life. Who is the voice you feel? Because we have so many voices inside of us sometimes and we don't know which voice we're going to feed today. So try to listen to your beautiful voice you have inside of you and try to follow this beautiful voice. What a wonderful film you've created, Fear as a Tool. Wonderful subject, I think somehow we can all relate to this. This is a question to all of you, Sanika, Sunny, Anika and Joana. What inspired you to make this film? So, uh, I think the main inspiration is, um, is actually the interest in the human emotions and how how powerful they are and how much impact they have on us is how we behave in our daily life, in our society and um, especially fear because fear is, I, in our opinion, or, yeah, the most powerful emotion that can um, yeah, maybe hold you back in living your full potential in life, like not just with like, extreme sports but also in life. And then, um, of course, the main inspiration was seeing Joanna going into uh, like incredible, insane for, for us <laughs> conditions. Um, yeah, surfing huge waves. And um, yeah, just uh, we just thought like analyzing this emotion, this, this emotion fear, which has such a strong impact on us, on someone that is actually facing that fear and actually dealing with that fear and maybe actually even not um, looking at it as something bad but as something good in life like I've never looked at fear as something good in life I always thought like you have to confront fear and um, maybe even stay away from it and then Joanna like actually opened my eyes and said no no it's a tool it's a good thing like you can actually use this and I always say fear is one thing and panic is another thing fear is good to have in life because puts you aware and panic, panic can kill you. So I think people need to know how to manage it and how to deal with the fear. And special as when we go to the big waves, we, we feel this every day. What is special with women directors? Uh, I think there's definitely a special thing about being a female director in the film, not only in surfing, but especially also in the film business because women have another perspective. Um, how we grew up as little girls was m mainly um, uh, dominated by m films made by men. men. So I think it's super important that there are more and more women making films, documentaries, short clips, whatever kind of genre, but that more and more women go out there, especially in um, areas like extreme sports and make their own films because they're really, really important role models for, for the girls out there. But I think especially now, because we live in the time of fear, so, movie, so like short clips like this is, uh, is more than important 
to inspire, to go out, to break the mindset. Joana, how do you think how do you think that the public can relate to to this message that you are conveying through the film? Don't let the, fe the don't let the the fear feed you. Especially in our pandemic society, um, grow more as people and question more instead of running away from that emotion. Uh, what is your message uh, on this uh, International Women's Day? I think um, the message is to face challenges, to be open to be re-educated, um, to empower ourselves. My message is go out and be ready for the adventure. Don't think too much. Don't like put all the things that which might be negative or risky away out of your head. Go out, trust yourself, breathe and uh, go your own way. I just say feel the fear and do it anyway. And we are in a, in a good way and in a good road. So girls power. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, I'd like to add something which, which is important for this project. As uh, we, we started it all on our own, basically, Sunny and me, uh, without any big sponsoring or producing it for a channel, because it's really in our interest to, to inspire and share and tell that message. And, and we are very happy to, to have met Joanna and build up this friendship and share this story, story, yeah, story and knowledge. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that, that the passion is really, really strong and the motivation too. And yeah, until now we did everything on, yeah, mostly on our, on our own. And this can also be a good inspiration to, to go for it. Hallo miteinander und willkommen. I'm Martina, the founder of AYA and the art curator for What If Women in Film Festival. Our mission at AYA is to empower artists whose work stands for change and ethics. In the artistic segment of the festival, we will present multimedia art from the past five decades by women exploring issues of diversity in celebration of the 40 years anniversary of gender equality in Switzerland. And this is why we are now reaching out to you to partake and inspire us with your vision and multimedia art. Please hand in your submission until end of April. In November, we will show the curated selection and until then, you can watch a multimedia artwork which has inspired us. Enjoy and we are looking forward to hearing from you. Hello, I'm Julie Hunt. Um, I made the short film you're just about to watch. I hope you like it. You can see more of my work at swissinfo.ch. In the meantime, I wish you a very happy International Women's Day. Voting Day is a story that takes place on a particular day, and it's the 1st of February 1959 in Switzerland. On that day, Swiss men voted no to granting women the vote, and then they went ahead and, and voted yes 12 years later in 1971, which is the anniversary we're celebrating this year. My book tells the story of four ordinary women from, very, from different backgrounds and uh, their lives are all connected by the fate of a foster child. I had the idea to do, to have this story about four women from morning until night on that day, passing from, from one woman's situation to the next and having them connected in some way. Once I did an interview with a, with, a, with a women's rights campaigner from that era, her name was Martha Gostely. When she described her disappointment and the disappointment of the whole group on the day of that 59 vote, uh, you know, she, she just it really made an impression on me. The Other Daughter is a dual timeline novel set in 1976 and 2016. In 76, uh, Sylvia is an ambitious young journalist 
who is desperate for her big break at the newspaper she works for in London. She persuades her editor to send her to Switzerland to report on the ongoing women's rights movement uh, five years after Swiss women got the vote at federal level. Um, and at the same time, she discovers she's pregnant. Uh, then 40 years later, Sylvia's daughter, Jessica, um, has discovered a big secret about her birth. She decides the only way to really get her life back on track is to come to Switzerland and find out what happened to her mother 40 years previously. I didn't at the beginning set out to write about women's rights, um, but at the time, uh, I suppose I'd been living in Switzerland a couple of years by then, and there were quite a lot of issues concerning women's rights and equality in the news at the time. And I just became really interested in it. Um, specifically, the women's liberation movement was sort of inspired by the um, 68 student riots and the liberation movements in America and elsewhere in the world. Um, and so I started reading up about the issues that were important to women in that movement, things like abortion, um, maternity leave, um, more nurseries, things like that. The research that got me uh, passionate about 1959 was uh, when I came across the book by Iris von Roten. It's called Frauen im Laufgitter, which means women in the playpen. And um, it's, it's just a really, really detailed uh, analysis of Swiss society at the time, which was a year before my book is set. The lack of voting rights is just, just this huge disgraceful fact that you can't get around that women have in Switzerland had to wait so long to, to get, get the right to vote but it's it goes deeper and wider than that um, you're you're talking about um, discrimination in the workplace a few opportunities for for training or for for uh, careers of any kind and um, a very very rigid kind of traditional attitude towards gender, gender roles and what was the women's place and the man's place and the man being the authority in the home as well. So, so women um, didn't have the same rights within marriage, also legally. They didn't have the rights to their own money or to make their own decisions, sign their own contracts. It was definitely a, a harsher climate for women in the 1950s. Darf ich fragen, was halten Sie vom Frauenstimmrecht? Ich bin dagegen. Warum? Die Frau gehört ins Haus. Sie soll Mutter sein und fertig. To bring about this reform, it, you couldn't just rely on a few, a few progressive men in Parliament. You had to actually have the agreement of the masses, of, of, of all men in the population, or a majority. And, uh, and, you know, and I wonder, in other countries, if men had had the final say, maybe women would have had to wait a lot longer everywhere else. The UK is ahead of Switzerland in terms of legislation, but that doesn't mean that attitudes change. Um, and I think, you know, there's still a gender pay gap in the UK. And I think in the 70s, even though a lot of the legislation had moved forward, there was still, there was still discrimination, there were still sexist attitudes, and you could argue that that's still the same today. There have been several um, female Swiss presidents, whereas the US is still waiting for one, the UK has only had two. So, you know, I think, in some ways, Switzerland's made great strides. I think no country is perfect. I think there's still a huge amount to do worldwide. We are closing in. One more film to go. It's called Womanhood, directed by the South African filmmaker Jolene Minar, who I will interview briefly right after. Let's watch this film together. I think freedom is something 
that I don't have enough of. Uh, I still have to, like, as a woman in South Africa, have to walk in the street or take a jog and not feel free. Um, so I'd love more freedom. I'd love to wear what I want without thinking about someone else first and thinking about myself. Um, just because I want to and not think, oh my gosh, what if? Like, oh, am I going to be uncomfortable in a certain space? I think to me freedom is safety, happiness, yeah. I think being able to express yourself without judgment. I suppose the time and energy and financial resources to do what you want. I think when I'm home, when I'm, I'm surrounded by my family, when I'm surrounded by my friend, when I'm surrounded by my township, so, see free go ku si ya kwazu teta since I yonkin as my text in tomang I food ni ya teta na sim seven zin. Um usually when my mom like leaves for like work, um I usually play music and cause I like singing a lot and then like I pretend like I'm singing in front of an audience. So that's when I feel like, oh yeah, this is me. Come pop for me, pop for me. Freedom is it's a bit of an extract term, it's more subjective depending on your circumstance. You know, I would um, call myself a privileged black, I grew up in a certain class, certain level of education, certain exposure internationally speaking. So my, my freedom is a bit different to the lady I might bump into who's a cashier in the shop. If we can't feel safe, then when we're on the streets, just being outside and enjoying this so-called freedom that we have, like, are we truly free? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we are completely free, no. It's just... We have to um, get better Yeah, surviving. learning new mechanisms to deal with everyday life. There's a lot of work to still be done. We're way better off, like, we're lucky. People fought for us to be more free, but we're not free-free. I don't think anyone's free-free in post-apartheid South Africa, to be honest. Mama, we have an abusive relationship. You are so messed up, cool, data. We are not going. We are not going to email. We are being nice. We are uniform. Sometimes back to school. But how soon can I have to go back? Our patalang is school fees. We learn to go in mess. Poverty is massive. I think that is a major thing that's holding women back. We grow up thinking that we must submit and we must follow rules and we must be do what we're told, but boys can be boys. I played football, I have 102 goals, more than men, but I, I think the gender is still killing us. If I was a guy, I'm sure, I was gonna be sitting in my house watching a waterfall somewhere. You could play today, play against Zimbabwe, in two weeks in the camp, probably you'll walk away around 4,000, 5,000 to 6,000. You know, you see Bafana Bafana playing, you know very well, with their salary they could buy a car after the camp. It's their choice. A compliment that was being paid to me by somebody else, to somebody else while I was in the conversation, where the, the very senior person said, um, you know, she has kids, but you'd never know that she does. We must keep our kids and our families separate from who we are and our work. Men are usually seen as, as, not, as being able to tuck it away because there's somebody else taking care of it. But when it's a woman, you're the one who's supposed to be taking care of it and doing the job. As a girl, you must grow up, get married. It's not chase your dreams, go to the moon, be a track athlete, you must get married and have kids. I was told that I don't look like a mechanic. So, yeah, for me it was just like, okay, so how is a mechanic supposed to look? I was walking in the park and this guy with kufia on, um, laying on the gardens, like laying on the gardens and he shouts to us, yeah, now you both. Yeah. yeah. When you retaliate, you made out to be the one who's overreacting because, oh, no, nah, they were just making a joke. Oh, girly, that's just a joke. I've definitely put other women down. It was me and another girl that were black in our class. We're friends now, but I think looking back, I could have been nicer to her, but it almost felt like we were competing for the same thing. I'm the reason I'm not as far as I would be. I'm not afraid of not succeeding. I'm afraid of the responsibility that would come with the success that for sure I would 
accumulate. So I think it's fear. So my family has always been accepting of who I was, being this diverse person, except when it came to being lesbian. Because I, I'm, I'm Muslim, first of all. It's not, not to say that specifically Muslims don't accept or is against um, gays. It's in every religion, really. But I think it's the people themselves that's less forgiving. It's been a tough journey. So I think at this point in time, like, we're all just trying to find our feet and, you know, working towards um, some light with regards to this. But I think I'd, I am not completely free when I'm, like, with my family. Yeah. In the Indian community at the age of 32, the expectation certainly from my parents and the immediate family and community is that I'd be married by now with two kids. Never mind my three university degrees, never mind the career path that I'm on. For my parents, there's always going to be a part of them that feels like they haven't fulfilled their duty as parents because they have an unmarried daughter. And it doesn't bother me as much as it bothers them, but what bothers me is that it bothers them so much. There's so many layers in what it means to be yellow in South Africa. And our population is around about like not even 1% of South Africa's population. Or well, I, I have no idea what her eyes will look like yet, but if they look anything like mine, I really hope that it will be in the time where she, she doesn't actually have people pulling their eyes slant and, you know, just walking past her because that's what you do when you see Asians. Coming out as trans, it doesn't, it doesn't negate what I am and ultimately what I am is my parents' daughter. Nothing I am or have become can change that. I'm, I'm still a girlfriend, I'm still a friend. I'm still everything that I always was. The only difference is that I'm me now. People find it um, like it's a compliment to say you are okay, babe, which is like you you're fat basically, and it's it's like almost like oh you're doing well in life or like you're eating where you are kind of thing. But at the same time, there's an undertone of like you okay, be like you're fat, like do something about it. Like your body must always be commented on. I hit puberty very early, um, so I already had like big boobs and stuff in like grade four, and that brought a lot of unwanted attention. It was quite tough being in an older body and not really matching that body. If I had to send a message to young girls today, it would be develop an honest relationship with yourself. The more you find positive things about yourself, the more your brain will believe it and the more other people value you for who you are and not what you look like or what kind of clothes you've got on. I just find the older I get, the more exciting life becomes. The more in my body I feel like, oh yes, this is who I am. When I got pregnant, I suddenly started feeling like I, everybody could now speak to me about this. And then I think I realized for the first time how huge my sexual identity had been, how like, how big a deal this from your persona is by the straat in the samenleving. So that you did it yourself. In skillet is it like he's a big deal from your now not even relevant is now. Like it's negated and it's in a completely different category. Yes, and some of our men say. This one is a phoenix. After I was booked off for a month due to anxieties and, and panic attacks. I rose back, and this time I went harder, because I remember just after three months being booked off, I opened my second salon, you know, and this was just a sign that, you can, okay, after every challenge, you can rise back, you know? Men, when they look at you, they see a different version of a woman. They think loose girls, they think clubbing girls, they think girls with no morals, you know? This is just my stories written in my body. Ago, 
go and basically I was just mourning a really hard relationship oh yeah didn't work out I think when I retired <laughs> when I retired I, I cried just because I was not ready when she was crying all the time and I was just like I don't know what to do I cried yesterday I cried yesterday yeah um, yo, I don't know. It's ah, it's it's also ah, your pain. It's hectic. I think it's hectic because there's so many women that I speak to that have the same experience and not in a good way, like the bad stuff that has happened in life. I mean, access is a huge thing for a differently every person. Then there's the pavement. In the middle of a pavement, there's a hole. So what do I do? Do I go back? If I don't go back, then I have to ask someone to help me. And either one or two things go happen. Either A, the person's going to help you, or B, the person's going to help you, but try to grow up me as well. It always seemed like the logical choice to just check out as opposed to living 60 years, praying to wake up as something I'm not. And like my suicide attempts were never, um, were never something I shared because like I, I was talking about shame, but like I was inherently ashamed that both that I tried and that I failed. This park wasn't this beautiful space like it is now. There's 15, 16 year olds, we were carefree. I remember thinking, oh shit, my mother's gonna be upset. Before I even thought about my own danger, I thought more, oh shit, I'm in trouble. So this is where it all happened. Um, and the next thing, this gang was on us. As they tried to get me on the floor, I fought back. They were a lot. And the next thing, one of the guys came and said, um, what the fuck is trap in I? And he just kicked me down. He was also the first one to rape me. When it got to about the third one, either my body or I couldn't take it anymore. And I, I was out. It was not my fault. It was not where I was. It was about them violating me. We teach our daughters to be safe, but we don't teach our boys not to rape. strong. You know, they don't get credit enough for that. And you're a psychologist, you're a doctor, you're a teacher, you know, <laughs> you're all of that. <laughs> hey? And everyone comes to you all the time and you must have the answers, you know. She works up quite a sweat when she has food. <laughs> She like really works really hard. Yeah, it's one Nisha. It's one Nisha. Yeah. So did you know um, that when my mom's mum was pregnant with her, all the eggs my mum would ever have went into her womb, and then I was one of those eggs. So her mum, you, and me, we have a very connection because yes. we were all in the same. Family. So when I carried you, I was also carrying my grandchildren. Yes. Yeah. I think kids growing up in houses where their dads do what their moms do and that it's not weird for their dad to be bathing them and putting them to bed or for their dad to be cooking them their supper, I think it, it sort of grows just a, a different way of being and a different way of living. Yeah, you little shit machine. They poo so much. Yesterday I changed a nappy, her poo was in her belly button. So gross. <laughs> I have to be her first point of reference, where I have to work on making sure that 
as much as possible she comes to me first so that I can kind of shape how she receives information around her. So everything that people tell you about pregnancy is a lie, it's a scam. Because I pictured like just regal experience, like just basking in the sun. Your milk can come in and it's a sickle and you're under the indruk that it's not so makkelijk gaan be. I have a headache almost every day. My back is really sore, my boobs, my boobs. When I'm starting, I'm like, is he in boobs so great and the is so plat? Like, this is really awkward. I have an ex existential crisis all the time, like every day. I'm just like, human being, this human being. Then when it settles and you actually like have this child that's really like comfortably just sucking away at your breast, you're like, this is, this is so much love. Like there's so much affection. It's kind of hankies, but like <laughs> stroking your breast and like a boy give it to latch, and it's, it's, it's like an intimacy that you that you can't with anyone understand. Oh, bango mama. I'm I'm so afraid to have a girl here. Yeah. There's so much happening. There's people are getting kidnapped, children, like the world wants to be cruel and wants to do messed up things to girls. So that's very, very scary. I don't want to be like tapping my feet every time she leaves the house. But yeah, I guess that's another thing to go through. It's your choice um, whether you want to bring a baby into this world or not. You don't have to become a mother by birthing your own child. The nurse also told me on my first day there, she's like, um, God's not going to hate you for doing this. She literally told me that. She's like, God's not going to hate you for doing this. For my mom's birthday, I wrote a card. Um, I can't remember exact, but I said, you, you are the best because you are so blessed. Your aura is so bright that the sun will envy you. This has been the best 11 years of my life. Yeah, that's what I wrote. <laughs> and you love me and no one will ever change your oh, mind. Oh yes, that, that's why. <laughs> that's my favorite. And they say there's nothing as wonderful as giving off your time because it's so limited. And when you get to 60, to 62, 63, and you understand, you know, that, uh, you have to do something you, for the children, for the children's children, because you see where this world is going to. Mm? We need to teach our boys to be responsible. To say to them, uh, to be strong does not necessarily mean to, to break down your sisters or your mothers, you know. They should be strong to build them up. Men have to come to the party, calling their friends out, calling their family out when um, casual sexism happens. I want to know about the Fisela in Pumelelo, Bafunde, Baby Right, Bangafanina, Mamma, as I'm in the Funda, got an arm to Safis and Yunyan in arm Safis, a weird school lady, one of the biggest things we've got to fix is, is the poverty in our country. We have to try to figure out ways to, to help people be able to um, work and to come up with their own small businesses and to be employed. I, I don't think women are free yet, but I feel like if we stand together, um, it will come. If you're in a position to hire especially, like make sure that you're giving opportunities to women. I mean, if you were to take the time and actually just sit and have conversations with women from different backgrounds, different paths in life, you are definitely going to be better off for it. Be yourself from inside and keep practicing. A lot of us want a better future for the next generation of girls. We want it to be easier for them than it is for us right now. Sometimes people say women and exclude certain, I mean, everyone who identifies as a woman. It's gonna be great. I can say to other women, there's hope. I am not defined by my way. 
show them the middle finger and say, you know what, you thought my life was over, my life is not over. I have just begun. We are getting more powerful black Dragon Ball Z fusion. If not acceptance, then tolerance. Understand your privilege, be kind. We are the big bone of South Africa. We really are, we are unsung heroes. There's no need for labels. I can love who I want to love. We need to be having more conversations. We need to strip ourselves a lot more. Recognize the connectivity that we do have. Jolene, what a perfect film, Womanhood. How did you come about to, to make this film? Womanhood was an amazing opportunity. I think it's like, it's like a filmmaker's dream, really, to, um, to sort of traverse the commercial filmmaking space, but also um, the documentary form. Um, and yeah, it was an incredible opportunity to be able to hit the road with um, a team of women film professionals and really go and speak to women from all walks of life to try and sort of get a finger on the pulse of, of what it means to be a woman in South Africa. And how did you find your characters for this film? My goal is always just to try and hit the most diverse and representative uh, cast makeup. I think it's, it's like a huge commitment I have in every project where I can to be able to speak to different demographics, different ages, different sexual preferences or gender orientations. I'm really committed to having crews that better represent our country um, and always trying to empower particularly women and particularly women of colour filmmakers to shadow or to come and join us and to learn. And that was that was pretty tough. I mean this was before Me Too movement and, and before the conversation around women participating in film um, is as commonplace as it is as, as it is now. But I think at the same time, I think there's still like a lot that we need to do. Um, I think turning down the volume on, on sort of whiteness and privilege um, as much as you can. Whether what we're seeing in those moments of like media is actually being followed through in the boardroom, is actually being followed through at a pitch level, at a finance level, um, we, you know, that still needs to be improved. Uh, hopefully more and more brands um, take these opportunities to, to allow for real conversations to take place um, uh, rather than like, you know, all the scripting and putting all that budget into these like short 30 seconders that are, you know, that run for like a week before they go on to the next thing. Rather put that money into something that can actually, you know, drive conversation, that can actually like contribute to society. Uh, I think also a lot of interest from from men in the audience who who really appreciated certain insights that they might have not quite understood before. What is your advice for aspiring filmmakers? For just back yourself. I think sort of really trust your voice and and trust that the merit in what it is that you have to say. Like, with social media and with you know with the internet and, and VOD now, like. The sky is really the limit. You know, I think that there are just amazing women filmmakers just going out there and creating their own content, you know, making their own YouTube series and next thing you know it, they're on Netflix, um, making their own Instagram, IGTV stories, they're doing it on Snapchat, 
TikTok. Um, it's it's just like it's insane, and it's it's just so cool to to kind of see all these different opportunities for storytelling. And I and I think that I consider that filmmaking. Uh, yeah, it's a blast. But I think yeah, surround yourself with good people, grow thick skin, and just always trust your worth and your value. Can I just highlight what Julian told us? The idea that filmmaking can be a vast field and any media is storytelling. It is important, it is necessary, and this is your message. Like she said, the sky is the limit. Thick skin and go out there. Find your voice, share it with the world. It needs it, you matter. So that's it for today. Happy International Women's Day. What a blast to connect. We meet again soon. Stay tuned, stay strong. And be bold, be you, be awesome. Bye. Bye. Okay, und jetzt freue ich mich natürlich extrem, wenn ihr natürlich alle dann kommt, ins Corso strömen, kommen schauen. Ende November ist es soweit. Das erste Women Film Festival in der Schweiz. Ich bin natürlich sehr stolz, dass es im Traditionshaus Gorsa stattfindet. Ähm, das Gorsa ist ein äh, Bautz Varieté. 1889 ist in den 30er Jahren, 20er Jahren, glaube ich sogar, umgebaut worden in ein Kino. Ähm, wir betreiben das Blue Cinema seit 1992. Für mich ist es das Premiere in der Schweiz. In Europa, auf der Welt. <lacht>